Hi, I am Harsha. Today I am going to discuss on a topic of Kalada and its disease management. So in this topic we will discuss on the microbiology, pathogenicity, treatment and how we can actually prevent the Kalada disease. So Kalada is caused by an organism called Vibrio cholerae. Uh, this Kalada microorganism is motile and they are facultatively anaerobic that is they can survive under the cell area where it can actually survive without an oxygen, so oxygen supply that's why it can penetrate the small intestine and then colonize there and cause the disease there these are gram negative rods they are curved gram negative rods having the structure and they may contain one or more flagella on either side of the rods they are halophilic that is they are they can they should require a little bit of salt for them to survive they reside in the tidal rivers with moderate salinity and they proliferate in the summer months especially when the temperature is above the 20 degrees celsius generally the symptoms of the cholera are firstly the diarrhea along with abdominal cramps and vomiting, nausea can be seen and headache is also sometimes common and fever is usually absent in this case of cholera. There are two types of serial groups O1 and O1 39 serial groups which are very toxic and they have caused widespread epidemic among the public. And coming to the microbiology and the epidemiology of the Vibrio cholerae, they comprise a host of organisms and it's based on the carbohydrate determinants on the LPS O antigens, that is the lipopolysaccharide O antigens present on its surface of the bacterial, bacterial cell. And these are divided into the two types, like uh, one which can agglutinate in the O1 antiserum and the one which do not. Generally the O1 serum groups are were all were the causative agents at the time and caused a severe uh, epidemics and disease caused disease caused at those times. There are two types of biotypes which have been classified namely uh, LTOR and classical and they are again subdivided into Inaba and Ogawa and Vibrio cholerae uh, they survive in the coastal sea waters and in the brackish estuaries mostly seen in this uh, Bay of Bengal in the coastal sea waters and in the estuaries uh, and coming to the infection how it is spread among the people it is usually infected with the water contaminated with the human faces. That's the main causative agent, uh, main causative factor which can infect the humans. The animal reservoir is not seen. Mostly it is infected through the contaminated water, sometimes due to the uncooked, pro uncooked properly, uncooked food from the sea waters, seafoods generally. And the infection dose is very high actually uh, but it is markedly uh, reduced in the patients who are hypochlorohydric that is the people who are having less uh, using antacids or any uh, drugs which inhibit the gastric acidity so in those people they have the highest risk in of getting the infection or sometimes when people who have just had a meal, they also can be prone to this uh, disease. And in the people in children less than two years of age, the cholera is not generally uh, caused in those in those children because until then people and the children are actually fed with their uh, with their mother's breast milk so in which they can actually uh, passive immunity and that way they can actually get out of this disease and yet 
people who are actually O blood group are at highest risk when compared to the AB blood group. So far, uh, there are uh, pre mm, there have been se seven pandemics happened in cholera, right from eighteen uh, hundreds to the recent one is the seventh pandemic cholera, which actually started in the year nineteen sixty one in Indonesia. Generally, cholera is is the native of uh, Indian Gangetic Plain. It actually started from the Ganges Gangetic Plain in India and Bangladesh and starts having several pandemics and then spread across the uh, whole globe. And the seventh pandemic happened in the 1961. It started from the Indonesia and at the time uh, a new strain started to appear called not unlike it, it until then it was a classic strain which actually caused pandemics and uh, deaths among the people at the time a new strain called LTOR started to emerge from Indonesia and then started spreading among uh, started spreading across the countries in Asia the main point in this uh, LTOR strain is that uh, Unlike the classical strain, which they actually happen in the coastal sea waters near the coastal sea belt, uh, but this LTOR strain can actually cause the disease in the inland waters as well. So that's the difference between the classical and LTOR strain. In that way, it can it has emerged as the uh, main causative agent among these uh, in spreading the disease. It started spreading to the Asia and it coming to the uh, Bangladesh and India in 1964s and they started spreading across the countries of this Bangladesh and India and in the 1970s it's exported in Africa as well and then it had it caused many deaths there and in 1990s 1991 it started exploded, exploded in Latin America. It started from the it started on the Peruvian coast in the Latin America, and then started spreading across uh, south south to the Latin America and also to the Central America, that is in Mexico. Initially, when it started spreading in Latin America, there was uh, Initially, the mortality was very high, around 30% mortality was seen in the public who have caught infected. But later on, um, their mortality was reduced around less than 1%. That's because of the improved hygiene and improved healthcare system and the awareness among the public, awareness among the health professionals as well about the disease. And in October 1992, uh, a new strain, a new serial group uh, started emerging from the southeastern India and it started spreading across the up and down around the across the Bay of Bengal in the, the coastal regions. Uh, this was neither O1 serial group or any of the serial groups. Uh, it's, it started spreading across the India and started went to went to the Bangladesh and spreading there, and gradually it, it spread to neighboring countries like uh, Pakistan, Nepal, uh, Western China, Myanmar, Bangladesh, uh, Thailand, and Malaysia. This strain or uh, new serial group is uh, O139. This is different from the O1 serial group, and People who have been vaccinated in, with the O1 are not protective against the O139. These two are different. And though this O139 uh, replaced the old LTOR strain, which actually spread it across that area, uh, this O139 started spreading, and by the by the beginning of the 1984, it, it gained its uh, 
dominance in that region. Um, but gradually, after some time, Eltor actually resumed its dominance in Bangladesh and the other areas, and in only a few areas itself, the uh, O139 Zulu groups have been, we can, we can find it. And currently, Vibrio Kalare O1 cell groups remains dominant in Southeast Asia. And coming to the pathogenesis, how it is actually infected in, in the humans. Now, we need this uh, cholera organism, the bacterial bacterium, to enter the human small intestine. So, it should pass through the oral route to the gastric acid, gastric acid and then go to the small intestine. This is a very long tra uh, traveling process and in between you can uh, come across the gastric acid. It is very difficult for the bacterium to survive and then go. So it requires a large inoculum size to actually uh, infect the humans. So that's why when people are having the meal when the gastric acidity has been decreased, gastric acid has been increased, that is the pH is increasing, uh, there is a chance of uh, infecting, there is chance of getting infected. And this uh, cholera is actually caused by a toxin called cholera toxin. It is an enterotoxin infecting in the gastrointestinal system. So if we require this cholera toxin, this requires large inoculum size to traverse through these gastrointestinal tract and finally uh, come to the area of small intestine and, to this, uh, and attaching to the epithelial layer of the small intestine. So this cholera, cholera bacterium, they either to the intestinal walls, the epithelial walls, by a pilus called, by a structure called a toxin co-regulated pilus, toxin co-regulated pilus, it's called as TCP. If you look into this picture, we can see the microbial -like structure of that intestinal epithelium and these are toxin co-regulated pili. So they form an anchor between the bacterium and the intestine. So they can they are just in a connecting bridge between that. So this is the way how it can it binds to the intestinal epithelia. And coming to the mechanism of action of this cholera toxin, the vibrio cholerae toxin, the cholera toxin is the one actually which in, which causes the disease. This toxin has uh, two moieties. One which is one is a monomer enzymatic moiety called A subtype A, and the second one is the subtype B, which is a pentameric structure. This B, but this subtype B binds to the uh, gangliocyte receptor. It's called a GM1 receptor in the intestinal epithelium on the intestinal epithelium. If you look at this picture, this B subtype is binding to that gangliocyte receptor and then and then this it gives an access for the A subtype to pass into the cytosol cytosol of the cell. Once the A subtype is passed into that, it activates the uh, the processes like it starts with the ADP ribosylation. It irreversibly transfers ADP onto the GTP binding and regulatory protein, and that one activates the adenylate cyclase activity. So, once the adenylate cyclase is increased, that is activated, there is an increased cyclic AMP levels and the cytosol. Once there is an increase in cytosol and CAMP levels in cytosol, it inhibits the sodium ions entering into the 
cell. So once the sodium ions are ent not entering into the cell, there is much of sodium ions outside the cell. That is in the lumen, there is a lot of sodium ions. And it also, this increase in CIMP levels, they, inhib they uh, activate the secretory mechanism, secretory activity of the chloride channels. So in that way, the chloride ions are uh, moved out of the cell into the lumen. So there is a lot of sodium and chloride ions together, sodium chloride is more and more in the lumen side. So what happens here? The water generally it is moved passively among the across the barriers. It is passively crossed across the barriers to maintain the osmolality. So here the sodium chloride is more in the lumen side, the water moves out of the cell to maintain the osmolarity. So obvious then finally the water is more in the outer into the lumen side and that leads to the watery diarrhea. So in that way the diarrhea is happening because of this loss of these cell nutrients. It's all because of the loss of the imbalance in the electrolytes. This cholera toxin, toxin co-regulated pilus and other virulence factors are actually co-regulated by uh, coordinately regulated by a gene product called ToxR. And cholera toxin is actually uh, is part of a genome of a bacteriophage called CTX5. This bacteriophage binds to the uh, toxin co-regulated pilus. In the uh, if the, this is in this picture, we can see the this is the bacterium, and these are toxin co-regulated pilus. And the color toxin binds to the to the toxin co-regulated pilus. So, and finally, when it, it when it is binding to the co-regulated pilus, then it gets integrated into the genome of that cell. In, in this uh, in this picture, you can see that the bacteriophage is the more is the main causative agent, and it is a mobile free genetic element. So that means it can actually pass from one to the other like that. It can even uh, attach to the non virulent ones, and then. Uh, bind to the to the toxin correlated pilus and then activate it and make it virulent. So in that way, this way of uh, genetic transfer is a horizontal gene transfer taking place and then it is leading to the more uh, formation of uh, new set of groups and strains across the in the blue color way. In this way, O139 zero group is thought to be mediate, uh, arise, thought to have arised from this uh, horizontal gene transfer from O1 L2 strain. O139 and O1 L2 strains are same exactly, except for two reasons. They have the they have different uh, lipopolysaccharide, and this one has a different lipopolysaccharide. O139 has an uh, has a capsule around it, so it is encapsulated. Generally, O1 L tor uh, zero groups are not having not do not have the feature of uh, encapsulation. So, coming to the clinical manifestations, uh, after around 24 to 48 hours of incubation in the humans. Uh, the watery diarrhea, which is a painless watery diarrhea, may, uh, may be seen in the patient and followed by vomiting uh, and even abdominal cramps, uh, muscle cramps can also be seen because of the imbalance of the electrolytes in the body. Uh, if not treated in the patient, may the patient may go into the hypovolemic shock 
and then finally death may ensue. Uh, coming to the uh, the stool appearance, uh, the stool appearance is generally grey in color with uh, mucus can be seen and uh, blood is not seen. It is uh, if we the light, the stool can be compared to the rice water stool. That is that uh, if we and the rice is washed in the water, how is it looked? How does it look like? That way the stool appearance can be seen. Fever is generally absent. So um, and mostly the dehydration takes place here. And that is the main cause to one in which may aggravate the disease. The body volume loss of around three to five percent will lead to the thirsty. The, so the person feels thirsty when in the beginning stage, and around when the five to eight percent of the volume is lost, the person starts feeling the postural hypotension and weakness and tachycardia. And greater than ten percent uh, oliguria can be seen and weak pulses can be uh, seen or absent pulses can be felt. The person may be having sunken eyes and they finally may go into the coma. In the patients of this color, uh, there is an elevated hematocrit levels. Because of the dehydration, the water content is lost and the so that mm, the hematocrit level is increased. And there is an increased uh, elevated uh, blood uronitrogen and creatinine levels and uh, reduced bicarbonate levels. So how is it diagnosed? The clinical manifestations are fine but how is it diagnosed? It is diagnosed by the stool sample. To find out whether the causative organism is, whether it's cholera or any other else, it can be seen by the dark field microscopy. And if you want to find out whether it is of uh, Inaba or Ogawa uh, serum group, it, you can uh, immobilize the bacterium with uh, anti serum using the Inaba and specific anti serum or Ogawa anti serum. And if you want to isolate the bacterium and culture it, and if you want to do this laboratory isolation, you can use the TCBS agar which is thiosulfate citrate bile sucrose bile salt sucrose if you see you can just do this picture uh, this when you take the bacterium and grow onto this agar it starts forming as a yellow flat colony so in that way the cholera can be diagnosed so how is the treatment done the treatment is generally uh, done with is very simple the adequate fluid replacement and the electronic replacement is the main purpose of this uh, treatment is and the treatment is generally given by oral, through oral route using the oral rehydration solutions the patient can be recovered yes, and when because this uh, treatment is given orally, we can use we can we can make use of the advantage of the uh, the sodium hexose co-transport mechanism. So the sodium can be transported into the cell with the use of uh, glucose. When glucose is also given by the sodium, it can uh, uh, sodium can be transported in, into the cells uh, with the help of active co-transport of the glucose in the intestinal epitheliums. So the, gen the general oral rehydrating solutions con concentrations are given in this table. Uh, this table is generally recommended by the uh, World Health Organization and these are the concentrations of the sodium, potassium, chloride, citrate and glucose. And this oral rehydrating solution is very safe to the patients, even in the infants it is very safe. It is generally recommended in for the cholera patients 
who are having this day and for for us for in the cases where, where people who have been severely dehydrated the initial treatment can be started with intravenously with the uh, ringless lactate and people who have been this is the best method of uh, starting with the starting off to treatment and compulsory the patient must take the potassium supplementation through oral route the potassium supplementation can be taken by mm, coconut water or orange juice so in either way potassium supplementation is very essential so once the patient gets recovered in few hours the patient can be uh, moved from the intravenous therapy and then uh, go on with the oral therapy using this low oral dehydration solutions the only thing is that the imbalance of these uh, electrolytes should be restored to the normal phase uh, antibiotic treatments is not generally recommended it's not at all required but uh, an antibiotic of single dose tetracycline or doxycycline can be given to the patients uh, to reduce the treatment uh, duration and also to re reduce the symptoms of the uh, diarrhea but tetracycline or doxycycline it should be given only in the adults but not in the children less than 8 years of age because uh, this will lead to the deposition of uh, uh, deposition of the bone and uh, teeth so that is why these are not advised to be given in children and people who are resistant and because of the resistance problems the antibiotics are generally not recommended among the patients in who are having color uh, if for in, in case if the patient is resistant to tetracycline uh, he can use ciprofloxacin or erythromycin is the best choice in the patients and especially for the pediatric cholera erythromycin is the good choice and prevention of the cholera is through usage of uh, safe water uh, let me make uh, make it possible that when we whenever we use the water it should it is uh, safe and i uh, drink uh, it's portable water and most important thing is that uh, sanitation of the sanitation is very important and the proper disposal of feces um, it should not open defecation when it is not recommended and so um, improved nutrition is uh, very much important and how attention are you paying in your food preparation is very important thing in here because of the contamination through any sources so this is this way you can prevent the color disease uh, vaccinations are also there and the oral vaccines are available uh, for the o1 serum group and o139 serum group as well what which have been running in the market and these have uh, uh, killed vaccines these are killed vaccines having the cholera toxin which is a recombinant cholera toxin with the b pentamidic subunit in the way o1 and o1 that are there and they can actually they are also effective in preventing the cholera this they have been studies in bangladesh and various other places and they found that it is able to prevent around more than 50 percent of the patients so vaccinations are also available for cholera treatment but mostly the use of clean and safe water drinking water is the most important and so that you can prevent the disease and the disposal of sanitary disposal of is recommended so thank you very much for watching the video and please subscribe for this channel.